Welcome to this Jeremy Bamba and White House Farm podcast season four. My name's Emma Morris and I'm joined today by my colleague Yvonne Hartley. Hi Yvonne. Hi Emma. That as a result of some comments made on our TikTok account, Justice for the number four, Jeremy Bamba, we've decided to do a mini series about could it really be true that everybody else is lying and only Jeremy Bamba is telling the truth? Is that what we're actually saying? So, Yvonne, I think you can understand why people are sceptical about, you know, we appear to be saying that all these other people are lying, you know, the relatives, the girlfriend, the police, the forensic science service yeah. and all that type of thing. And only Jeremy's telling the truth. So is that really what we're saying? And, and how can we put forward that idea of that, it, you know, it's only Jeremy that's being honest? Well, yeah, and that the, since the disclosure in 2011 and the study of the documentation, so many changes in evidence and obvious lies have become apparent. It's about a whole range of people, from the relatives right the way through the system to um, Julie Mugford, to police and even to the scientists. And so there's far too many to cover today. So that's why we decided on the miniseries. And we'll highlight one individual group of people in each episode. So, but people did have motives and people did have reasons why they chose to lie, whether that was um, in order to inherit, whether to stop them getting into trouble, whether to just build a case against Jeremy. So there was all manner of reasons why people have altered evidence and have deliberately and intentionally lied, some of them under oath at court, and that is all documented. We're not saying... We believe that they lied. The evidence is in the documents. But so we know they lied. Absolutely. And, the, and other people's stories continually change over the years. One quick example is the story of P.S. Buse and the movement in the window, which we'll talk about when we do the police. But, you know, people who know Jeremy's case will know how many times he's altered the evidence about what he saw or didn't see through the bedroom window when they first arrived at the scene. Jeremy's story has remained since day one exactly the same. Nothing has changed in statements, in testimony, in, in any evidence. He has been consistent. Yeah. So in order, to, in order to tell lies, you have to have a very, very good memory. And it seems that these people just simply forgot what they'd said before. And so that's how they've been caught out. So we now can say that they have lied or been untruthful with their evidence. Yeah. So I think this all starts, doesn't it, with Jeremy's extended family who learned very soon after the tragedies that they were not going to inherit and that Jeremy, who was known as the cuckoo by uncle, his uncle Robert Bowflower, wasn't he, because yeah. he was adopted, was going to inherit pretty much pretty much everything wasn't pretty he much everything yeah the businesses the land the money the everything so, and that's always yeah. been put forward obviously as the motive as to why jeremy committed the crimes and you, you know the, i think the mo it's obvious the money played a massive part in jeremy's conviction but that wasn't his motive he didn't do anything but the motive Absolutely. of the family to start accusing jeremy and, you know, constantly harassing the police, ultimately, that we believe this is Jeremy, we believe this is Jeremy. And it, their reasonings behind their suspicions of Jeremy are the things that we are going to talk about today in terms of questioning the honesty about, you know, that ultimately from day one. Yeah, that's right, Emma. I mean, the, we couldn't possibly cover everything that we have that has come to light over the past 39 years. But what we can do is highlight just a few of the key untruths that we know the relatives were responsible for. So I think yeah. we should get out firstly, Emma, who the relatives are for the people who don't know and names were and their relationship to Jeremy. I agree. But I also think it's fair for us to cover why we believe they were money-driven. 
Yep, absolutely. An example. So, yeah, so if you, can you give a rundown of who we are talking about when we say the extended family or the relatives as we'll refer to them throughout? So, yeah, so we'll start with the oldest down to the youngest. So the key relatives, because obviously we don't need to go into everybody, but uh, the key relatives or as we call them, the beneficiaries. So first we'll start with Pamela Bowflower. So Pamela Bowflower was June's sister. She mm. was married to Robert Bowflower, who Jeremy's uncle, who was quite responsible for Jeremy's conviction. Their children, Anne Eaton and David Bowflower, are also who we're going to talk about today. There are other mm. relatives, such as Anthony Partiger and everybody, but we're going to feature just that particular family, the Bowflower family, uh, today. Yes, they were they were pretty instrumental in um, trying to convince the police that Jeremy was responsible from very early on. So why do we, you know, what were the first signs and the, the first bit of evidence that we've got that would indicate that money was, or the money from the Bamber estate was important to them? So within hours of the tragedies and the family learning of them, they all descended upon Jeremy's cottage. And it didn't take very long before Anne asked Jeremy, so that was his cousin, asked Jeremy mm. for June Bamber's wedding and engagement ring to give to her mother Pamela because she'd always wanted it. She also asked for paintings that apparently the family had been promised. Now this is our... Sorry, this yeah, I was, hours after he just lost hours. his entire family. Yeah, it's not even, well, we'll wait a week. So, no, it's hours. And wow. So Jeremy is distraught. And obviously he said no. He said my mother is to be buried with her wedding and engagement ring. That is what she would have wanted. That is my belief, what she's always said. It turned out later on that Anne actually got those rings because she'd approached Davidson at the mortuary, D.S. Davidson, and said, oh, I'll take June's rings, and took them. So, but we only discovered that after the disclosure of documents in 2011. So when Jeremy found that out, he was particularly upset because he thought his mum had been buried as she wanted to be with her rings. The police shouldn't have given them to her, should they? They shouldn't. And there's no doc, no signed document authorising her to have possession of them. So she wasn't next of kin. Jeremy was next of kin. But it seems to have been this, the cuckoo approach to the adopted son, that they never accepted Jeremy as next of kin because he wasn't family. It's like Robert Bowflower with the um, assets from White House Farm always referred to them as the family treasures and that Jeremy wasn't entitled to them because he wasn't family. He was the cuckoo in the nest. I mean, that's, um, that's quite outrageous, really, isn't it? The f- it is outrageous. It's, it's disgusting. I mean, it, just to uh, even ask, like you say, within hours of something like that happening, who's, I don't, my brain wouldn't work that way. I wouldn't, it wouldn't even dawn on me to, well, I don't think the, the vast majority of people's brains will work that way. Would they? You don't you don't lose somebody who you're supposedly close to and then say, all right, well, they promised me this, that and the other. You don't do that. And then take them anyway, even dis- despite take Jeremy them. saying no, his mother would have wanted to be buried with her rings. Yeah, completely think- disregard that and, and take them anyway. Exactly. I think some of that stems from the fact that when Jeremy went to visit his solicitor with the executor of the estate, Basil Cork, on the 8th of August, this is the day after the tragedy, it was that was mainly done so that they could arrange the business plans. It was a farming business. Mm. They were waiting. It was crops that were being brought in. It was the middle of a harvest. So they had to sort out the management of the farm for that initial stage till matters have been sorted out. Um, but during that time, um, the wills were read to Jeremy. And when Jeremy went back to his cottage after, they asked, the relatives asked, have we been left anything? And Jeremy explained, well, 
We know there's just a, a, a nominal amount of money for Anne and for David and the, the cleaner and basically everything, the, the majority of everything else. Would as a sole remaining beneficiary of Neville in June, then he would inherit the remainder, which included land, it included businesses, and mm. and some monetary gain as well. And there was something else about the land, wasn't there, that Neville had, had agreed to eventually sell some land to Anne and Peter, her husband. Um, that Jeremy didn't know anything about it, did there? It was a secret deal, but ultimately that meant that Jeremy would inherit the land that Neville had actually promised to Anne and Peter. So they were they were losing a lot more than just an inheritance they thought that they would get more of. I think, you know, she got a nominal yeah. amount, didn't she? £200, yeah. pounds or something. I'll just so- explain that Peter is Anne's husband. Uh, they ran a farming business as well. Now, Peter's brother... And family, and father, and family were also in the farming industry. Now, some land came up for sale when his father died. Anne and Peter couldn't afford to buy it, so secretly Neville bought the land for them to farm. Now, mm. the idea was that at such a time they could afford to, they would then reimburse Neville, and the land would then be theirs but it never reached that stage. Now, Jeremy had no knowledge whatsoever about this secret land deal. In fact, Jeremy has, has expressed that even June didn't know about this secret land deal. It was kept very much undercover, um, probably so that Anne and Peter didn't feel embarrassed about the fact they had to do get land this way in order to farm and, and uh, Neville's generosity in that. Um but ultimately, after they died and the estates would be settled, that land would then be owned by Jeremy. So it sounds like from the from the get-go, Anne had concerns about her future in relation to what was going to happen to this inheritance. So what else, what started to happen from then on? So it, almost immediately from that point, they seemed to suspect, in inverted commas, Jeremy, didn't they? They did, yeah. That seemed to be the catalyst for what happened next. And from the 8th of August, the Robert Boswell particularly and Anne Eaton would bombard, that's the only word I can use, bombard Essex Police with telephone calls, visits to Whitton Police Station, continually forming a relationship with particularly two police officers, D.S. Jones and D.C. Barlow, with their theories about Jeremy and Jeremy did it, Jeremy did it, Jeremy did it. At Mad Outset, they were having family meetings. They were, but also on the 8th of August, Anne offered to Jeremy, look, when, you know, do you want me to go to the house? Do you want me to clean the house when the police have finished with it and everything? Jeremy's in a completely distressed state of mind and actually signed an authority for the police when they'd finished with the house to hand the keys to Annie. And well, she must have thought that that mm. was a blessing beyond anything because that's when they went, in their words, hunting for clues. So that would further then be able to, they hoped, be able to hope that they would, could point the finger at Jeremy. But during the time they were in the house, so they got the keys on the evening of the 9th of August, they entered the property on the 10th of August, and as well as looking for clues, they started removing, just taking the property. So they were taking pictures, they were taking antiques, they were taking jewellery, they were taking money out in uh, June and Sheila's handbags, they were rifling through Neville's pockets, taking whatever cash they could, including his wallet. Now, he did ultimately leave the wallet in a car, but that the money had been removed. So they, they took the opportunity. Of and taking- didn't they, they lie about that as well, and, um, which we can establish from the documentation, where they told Basil Cock, the executor, Jeremy had given them permission to remove items from the property, but they told... They told the Jeremy. It was Basil Cock. That's right. So, so That's they right. lied about that 
And it was neither of them. They didn't have any authority to remove any items of value from the farm. But that they also took guns from the house. So the police hadn't seized all the weapons that were in the house. They only took the, the singular rifle that was found on Sheila's body. Their relatives took the remaining. So this gun covers yet another lie because they said that Neville was meticulous with, Robert Bothwell said he was meticulous with gun safety. There's no way we'd leave guns lying around the house for Sheila to get a hold of. And, um, so Jeremy must have, you know, he's lied, he's lies, Jeremy's lies about leaving a gun out and Sheila accidentally or seeing that gun and seizing the opportunity. It, it all unravels because in witness evidence, they are saying they found guns on the stairs, in the toilet, in, in upstairs rooms. They found guns all over the house. So that unravels the other lie about Neville being meticulous with gun safety and they were always clean and always locked away in the gun cupboard. Because the gun cupboard didn't even lock anyway, but the guns were all over the house. So, so they ultimately told on themselves, didn't they? Yeah, because Anne kept detailed right. notes, which when you read yeah. them, it, you know, is what actually contradicts. So it's not, it, you know, it's it's not as speculating or making this up. Anne actually told on herself, didn't she? Yeah, and all she of did. this is, is documented by... It's all um, in their statements. It's all in their own statements. But as well, it, you see, this even leads on to yet another untruth. Because... In 1991, Anne Eaton was telling the uh, City of London Police how completely afraid she was of Jeremy, how mm. how she had this fear that he would do something to her or the family, the remaining wider family. But this is another untruth because the week after the tragedies, so remember, Anna's got the keys, the relatives have been mm. to the house. Jeremy didn't know they'd been taking stuff. But Jeremy, being mm. Jeremy, bought Anne some flowers and had them delivered as a thank you for helping. Yeah? Little mm. did he know yeah. what we'd be helping themselves to or trying to frame him, but he sent us some flowers. So he went to Anne's farm and... Uh, just said, oh, did you like the flowers? She looked upon that as being highly suspicious action of him sending flowers. She thought the police was highly suspicious he sent these flowers and everything. But the reason and the purpose for his visit was so Anne could return the guns to Germany. So if she had a fear of her life, of this person who she's telling the police they strongly suspect killed the entire family. Yeah, mm. she were on her own at her farmhouse in Bad Germany in to give him the guns. So does that ring a bell of truth? And she also not. said she tried to provoke him or provoke a reaction out of him, didn't she? She absolutely did because she, he was talking about the arrangement for the flowers for the funeral and she said to Jeremy, well, we'll get some black roses for Sheila. Charming. And like you say, everything Jeremy did, they viewed as suspicious, didn't they? And it even went as far as Robert Bowflower suggesting that Jeremy dyed his hair black after the tragedies to hide blood in his hair. Exactly. But this is what's even more ridiculous is that the police were like, oh, well, we'll follow that up then. Yeah. But what? Don't you just wash it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's blood washes out of hair, doesn't it? I mean, it, you know, it's an absurd suggestion. So anything Jeremy did was seen as, you know, was viewed as suspicious by the family. You know, a lot of that has lived on in, you know, people thinking about, you know, Jeremy's behaviour. And I think we'll, we'll probably do a separate podcast focusing on Jeremy's behaviour or alleged behaviour. But, yeah. um, you know, they're so desperate for Jeremy to be the perpetrator that, the, you know, the sim simplest of things that he's doing, buying flowers for somebody, is viewed with suspicion. I mean, it's, it's, it's a chance, did he, really? I mean, well, exactly. 
the, you know, he was on his own. He was isolated because uh, you would have found a situation like that when you've lost the entire of uh, your family that your relations would rally round to support you. They didn't yeah. rally round to support Jeremy. They wanted to alienate Jeremy because he was the cooker. He was going to inherit. He would have inherited his Uncle Robert's farmhouse where he lived, where he conducted mm. his business from. He would have inherited the majority share of the caravan park, which was their sub I mean, that's now their wealth turned into their main income, did the caravan park. It's a very lucrative business. At the time, it was like a side business. It was yeah. lucrative. But he would have been the majority shareholder in that. They couldn't have. How could they? No, no, no. they could, you know. We can only speculate the types of conversations that they had, you know, convincing I mean, themselves. I mean, it's other lies, Emma, that are very influential on the case, such as the silencer. So it's, we know that David Belfort found the second silencer in a cupboard. We know the police found one originally on the day. It's documented. We know yeah. there was a second silencer that David found in a gun cupboard in a dusty cardboard box. Now, this is the silencer that Essex police then tried to link to the incident with scratch marks and blood and paint. We'll discuss that in another of these mini series yeah. because that comes into the lies of the police. But, um, David Bowflather, he was asked, did you touch the silencer? Did, did you manhandle it? Did you have any physical interaction with it? No, no, didn't do anything with it. At trial, he said, yeah, I tried to unscrew it, and I tried with force to try and get the end off, would I think? Well, that's it. You, like you say, you've got to have a good memory if you're going to lie got about to have things. A good memory. But we yeah. know, we now know that not one, but two blood groups were found in that silent side. And one of them was matched either Sheila or Robert Belfry. The second one matched either Pamela Belfry or David Belfry. Now we know that Pamela's DNA was taken in for the 2002 DNA. It's not hers. But we know that two, that an unknown male's DNA was discovered. Who didn't give a buckle swab? Neither David Belfry or Robert Belfry. Give a DNA sample, did they say? So? Give a DNA sample. So it's like, we're not going to speculate that that, that it was their blood or their DNA, but it, it wasn't Sheila's. No, it wasn't Sheila's. But it does beg the question, particularly when they both present when the case silencer, the singular one that Essex Police said he was, was discovered. They were both there, they were both present. Yeah. Um, it was physically examined. It was thrown in a carrier bag along with bullets and goodness knows what else. I mean, there was no forensic integrity to the sounds of the David Bowfly recovered. The, um, we know that Stan Jones went to collect it two days later, put it in a kitchen roll tube and threw it in the back of his car after drinking a bottle of whiskey. I mean, where's he and, and, that in that evidence? There isn't any at all. This day and age, that would not stand a chance of getting into a court. No, exactly. That evidence, not a chance. And we now know she wasn't, she wasn't, yeah, she wasn't shot with a silencer on the weapon anyway. We've oh. had, um, you know, chief medical examiners from the US, ballistic experts all agree that she was shot without silencer on the weapon. So the silencer in itself is a red herring. Well, but not even, neither of the silencers is, uh, in any way connected to the case other than the connection that has been manipulated by, um, Essex Police. But we will talk about yeah. that in a different episode of this series. I mean, you could you could say, or people might say, oh well, you know, David probably thought, oh, I'll, you know, I'll get into trouble for you know messing around with a, an exhibit or, or or whatever. But one thing um, that really strikes me about Robert Bowflower is that he told the police that Jeremy had said to him and Pamela that he could easily murder his parents. Yeah, um, apparently this happened at the caravan park after a meeting. And Jeremy so said, well, I could easily kill my parents, it's fine. But when Pamela was asked, she denied that that conversation happened. Yeah. So, 
if the family were just trying to get to the truth, the truth about what happened, if they genuinely suspected Jeremy, why would they make up such a horrendous um, and incriminating lie about, or why would Robert make up such an incriminating lie about Jeremy? It's not about getting to the truth. It's about no. convincing the police that Jeremy was responsible, even even though they had absolutely no evidence, no reason whatsoever yeah. to believe he was. I mean, Pamela said she had no recollection of that conversation at all. So, um, you should remember it, wouldn't you? <laughs> Well, you certainly because wouldn't you? Wouldn't husband and wife discuss that in an evening? Can you believe what he said? Oh, I can't believe he said that. You yeah. discuss it, wouldn't you? Oh. Yeah. So that's that's really really concerning that he would but like. Is that um, about Sheila's knowledge of guns and being able to use a gun? The relative yeah. said she couldn't put beans on toast. She wouldn't be able to fire a gun. It's that. Like, How would they know? They they barely ever saw her. Exactly, they hadn't seen her for over a year, but they they pretended that they were really close to Sheila and had a really good relationship with her and knew her intimately. They didn't. When Sheila sent Annie Eaton a letter from the hospital the previous March when she'd been admitted into the psychiatry mm. unit and admitted to the police, oh, yeah, I did get a letter from her, but I just said to Peter, oh, look at this letter of Sheila and put it in the drawer. She didn't even respond to the letter. Yeah, and responding is it? They didn't have an intimate knowledge. They'd never rung Sheila up while she lived in London. They'd never been to visit her. Don't think they even knew her address, did they? They didn't know her address, no. Maybe when Sheila was a child and there was more family interaction that, you know, she, they were closer, but certainly not while Sheila was an adult. And he, um, David also, um, conveniently forgot about a shooting, he wanted to portray Sheila as someone who couldn't use a gun um, and conveniently forgot about a shooting holiday that he actually went on with Sheila until yeah. he was forced to admit to it in court. He was forced to admit to it in court because he got caught out. So even in court, he said, no, no, we haven't been on a shooting holiday. No, she, I've never seen a fire a gun. That's what he said. I've never seen a fire a gun. And then... He was asked about the shooting holiday which had taken place in Scotland a few years previously. And he went, oh, yes, the grey matter is beginning to work. Yeah. And it's like, really? Oh, yes, she did fire the gun. And it's like, you knew she fired the gun. Never mind, she couldn't even put beads on toast. She was quite capable of loading and firing a weapon. Quite capable. So we... We've established there's been quite a few lies told by the beneficiaries, as we call them, the extended family. There are a lot more, Emma, but to go into it, it would take hours and hours. We've just highlighted a few, but if anybody says, yeah, but there... So if anybody listening to this podcast thinks, oh, but they said this about Jeremy and they said that about Jeremy, come back to us, let us know, contact us through the Facebook group, if you're on the Facebook group. Contact us on X, contact us through the website. Do you have any questions at all about affirmations that the relatives made about Jeremy that you want clarity on, you want to know if that was true or that was a lie? Simply contact us and we will come back and we will answer the questions. Yeah, and I think anybody hearing anything, you know, rumours about Jeremy or anything about Jeremy's behaviour, I need to think about where it came from. And, it, you know, if, it, if it's come from the both flowers, the Eatons, then it needs to be treated with scepticism. It, yeah. It, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because, we, you know, we can, we, like saying, we can prove that they absolutely lied and told some horrendous lies about Jeremy. Absolutely like, horrendous. Know, and it's not... He <laughs> needs to murder my parents. And, you know, he's, a, he's, he's an awful lie about him. This isn't hearsay evidence. This isn't things we've been told or things that we've thought, oh, well, that must have happened. This is documented. They have done it themselves. Evidence that they gave, 1985, 1986, 1991, 2002, all covers the lies. So it's not us saying it. They've said it. They've told on themselves. And I think, that, you know, all started with the um, the alleged fry-up as well, didn't it, that Jeremy, you know, the came home after. 
Uh, didn't yeah. it? Wouldn't it? Uh, a piece of bacon he heated up in the microwave or something and took yeah. one bite out of, and that was it. That was his fry up. That was, was. his fry up. A warm yeah. piece of cold bacon from out of the fridge for. Yeah. Yeah. So, so but yes, I mean, it, there, there are other people who are going to cover in this series, aren't there, Emma? There's Julie Mugford next time. Um, then we'll go on about, and probably during that, we'll about police changing their people about people who change their stories over the course of the years. So they're like, as I mentioned earlier, Pierce Views. Uh, there's also, we're going to do one about the police. And yeah, I think, I think, and how clever the police are at manipulating evidence as yeah. well. Um, and their you know, interview not, tactics. Yeah, and we're not suggesting that everybody involved in the case has, has lied. But, oh, um, absolutely we're... not. It only takes one bad apple. And, yeah. and, it only takes a bit of manipulation, you know. We yeah. we we will talk about um, coming in the next episode. We can talk about in in particular Colin Cavell's statement, which was changed by just one word, which changed the entire meaning of what was being said. So we'll um, we'll save that for next time. But um, but for this episode, Yvonne, I just want to say thank you very much for joining me. You're welcome, and Emma. We'll, thank you. We will see you on episode two. Hi. Hi. If you'd like to join our mailing list for the latest updates on the case as they happen, please email us via our website www.jeremy-bamba.co.uk. 